On this episode, we go over some of the rules of thumb that we've learned over our combined 40 years in Bangkok. So if you ever feel overwhelmed trying to make sense of life in Thailand, you'll find a lot of insight in this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. So what do you up and welcome to the Bangkok podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who came to Thailand in 2001 on the very rare 20 year expat schlub visa, <laughs> which is about to run out. So I got to find I think you one. can renew those. Cool. <laughs> and I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one year teaching contract almost 22 years ago, fell in love with the at least 20 minutes of previews and ads that come before Thai movies which means I can show up really late and not miss the movie. So I never left. It's a good love, love loader leave because I hate them because I'm always done my food before the previews are even finished. Yeah, you know, it was one of my uh, very, this was my first month in Thailand. I went to go see a movie with a student and her boyfriend and they were like my uh, kind of like tour guides or, you know, I had a million questions about Thailand and my first movie in Thailand was at the Emporium. And... Um, uh-huh. We were sitting out in the lobby, and the movie was supposed to start. And I and I said, like, oh, we got to get in there. And my student said, <laughs> my, 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 you know, my, my student said, you are totally new to Thailand. And I'm like, yeah, noob. I'm like, yeah, I am. Like, we got to get in there. And she, and she was just like laughing, and I'm like, why? But it's because it's <laughs> there's funny. twenty. I feel like sometimes it's almost even thirty minutes. Am I wrong? I mean, it's, it's, it's sometimes, yeah, no, it's insane. At least twenty. It's insane. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, we want to say a quick thank you to one of our patrons, Steve Shea, who supports us at the show shoutout level. Stick around after we're done talking about tips and theories that will help you understand Bangkok better to hear why fate almost made Steve and Greg Pat Pong drinking buddies. Yeah. We want to give a big thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Patrons got a whole bunch of cool stuff, including our ad-free regular show a day early, emails with behind-the-scenes photos of our interviews, access to our Discord server to chat with me, Greg, and other listeners around the world, and various other goodies. But best of all, patrons like Steve also get an unscripted, uncensored bonus episode every week where we riff on current events and Bangkok topics. We just finished recording this week's bonus show, and we chatted about Greg's conjunctivitis adventure at Bangkok Christian Hospital, my ultra-masculine experience seeing Top Gun Maverick alone, even though I was supposed to see it with a friend. Long story. Uh, and some talk on my new camera I purchased today and the risks of buying secondhand products in Thailand. To learn how to become a patron, click the support button at the top of our website. That's right. And as always, if you got something interesting to say or a show idea or a joke or just want to say hi, head to BangkokPodcast.com. Click the little microphone button on the bottom right to leave us a voicemail that we will play on the show. All right. Well, on this episode, we thought it would be fun to extend a discussion that Ed and I have had at various times over the years about the hidden rules and theories on how Thailand works. So we thought it might be fun to collect them all here and discuss. Now, being the keen observers that we are, we've managed to distill our observations about life in Thailand into some very general guidelines and rules of thumb that apply to most, but not all, situations in Thailand. And we've probably touched on one or two of these on various shows in the past. But like I said, let's put them all down here for posterity and discuss. So, uh, so Ed, what do do you think of this? I love this idea. Uh, I personally have three separate theories that I think explain a lot of stuff in Thailand. Now, uh, to give credit where credit is due, it's not necessary that I came up with all these theories myself. Some of them came from friends of mine or people I encountered along the way, wise old expats. But there are things that just right. there are things that just stuck where I was like, yes, that makes total sense, or at least it helps right. me. It just helps me understand what's going on in this country, you know. Uh, so I've got I've got three. I've got three. Right, right, right. And a lot of these things they 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 they're the result of like long conversations or drunken ramblings with friend or back and forths, and you finally arrive at like the one. Bing, that's right. light bulb moment. And that's right. like, like you said, you go, yes, yes, that's it. That's what it is. That's how things work. And so that's what's going on. Yeah, 
Exactly, exactly. Like, and, no, and none of these are like, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning discoveries that are going to blow anyone's hair back. But uh, I, I always refer to these things and I think about them a lot. And I think they're pretty good at sort of explaining how things work here. I don't know what to call them. I guess they're kind of rules of thumb or I don't know what to call them. Yeah. But they're kind of rules theories. Of thumb, yeah. theories. <laughs> I don't know. I guess. I don't know yeah. what they are. Um, Hypotheses. That's right. Well, I'm going to begin at the beginning, yeah. which is my universal... My, I call it my universal theory of Thailand, which I have mentioned on the show before. Not sure if I was on the main show. I know I've mentioned on the bonus show. But I call it Ed's universal theory of Thailand. And basically it goes like this. All the good things in Thailand come from Thai people being so nice. Because yeah. Thai people are just genuinely nice people. But all bad things in Thailand come from Thai people being so nice. <laughs> all right it's the same thing right. it's like i think i think that a lot of problems come from you know thai people not being confrontational or being too nice i, I think this explains a lot i mean what, what what's your take um i think i might need a little bit of more ex- explanation from ajan ed but i can see how yeah like the, you know this the land of smiles ties are always friendly they can have they have they give you a lot of flexibility about being a dumb foreigner. Oh, don't worry about him. He didn't mean to leave his shoes on when he went on top of the thing, or <laughs> you know he forgot to he forgot to why the thing. So he's a dumb foreigner. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of leeway given. They're they're very flexible and they give you a lot of uh, room to maneuver. Okay, well here's an example just to explain what I mean. You know, it's kind of common sense that there's a lot of advantages when people are nice. That's good. But what I mean sure. what I mean by by the second half of the theory is that. For example, I, I often encounter um, uh, like staff people um, who are really trying to help. But their heart is clearly in the right place, but they just don't know what they're doing, or, or, or they're obviously very poorly trained. Okay, yeah. And um, I've I've had this experience in some Thai companies I've worked for, where there are just employees there who they they just can't do their job. I mean, I don't know. There's no other way to put it. They just can't do their job. But but I think that. Maybe something's wrong with how people are trained or because the bottom line is the when you have to act in a professional way, it's harsh. You know, there's standards, you know, so if you're going to work, if you're going to work at a restaurant, you have to be good at certain things. If you're a waiter or a cook or whatever, you have to be good at X, Y and Z or you're gone. Like, at least that's that's my experience in the jobs I worked at, you know, but I'm not sure that's I'm not sure that's true in Thailand, though. Well, I think I've told the story on here before about how. Uh, you know, a friend of mine once owned a company and he had, I don't know, 20 employees or something like that. And he decided to put a Facebook blocker on one day. And so he turned it on. He's like, by the way, everyone, no more Facebook at work. And the next day, like four people quit. You know, <laughs> like, so they, they were obviously not doing anything. And they, they, they relied on Facebook so much that they weren't working. But I mean, maybe the, the, the company culture was just too nice to really do anything about yeah. it. Anyway, it's just a theory. Um, it, and it certainly doesn't explain everything. But I, I just think niceness it sounds all good but it's not it's not all good do you think that uh, that might be part of the the old standby about how you know like problems are never uh, met head on like no one will ever say something to your face yeah that's and, right like that's right yeah that's right yeah but but is that always a is that always a bad thing no no, no it's not always bad i'm saying being nice is genu- generally good i think people should be nice right. but it just, it, I, I think it can't be taken too far. And there's certain situations where you just have to put your foot down and say, no, this sucks. Like, do it again. Or you're bad at this. Like, you got to get good. Here's your second chance. But if you can't do this, you're gone. And, I, and I'm sure I'm sure people get fired from Thai companies. I, anyway, I'm just curious. I'm just throwing it out there. I, I'm curious if if any of our Thai listeners agree with me. But my, my experience working uh, in a Thai company and, 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 and now at a Thai university is they're too nice <laughs> like to the employees they're too nice you know it's like they're, 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 there's not a a high standard of performance that's just that's just my opinion just just throwing it out i wonder there. what happened if i came in came into a thai workplace and i just reeked of bo like i hadn't had a shower for three days no ties like, care about that I, I, no, I, ties care about that they care about that but would they tell me would they say hey look man you stink you got to go home and have a shower well or probably like no we're, probably we're, not directly man i don't nice. think they would say it directly like they they would they would find some nice way to imply it <laughs> when they like should some just guy would walk by my walk by my desk and trip oh i accidentally spilled some deodorant on your desk there <laughs> anyway you should probably just keep that i don't need it <laughs> That's actually pretty funny. But yeah, no, no. When, you know, sometimes you just got to say, dude, stop. You stink. I'm sorry. 
you got to go home and take a shower. But uh, I don't think Thai, Thai people would do that. <laughs> I don't right. think they would. There's only one way to find out. <laughs> Greg and Ed test this theory. <laughs> All right. What do you got? You, you got a theory? Yeah, no, this is something I've definitely mentioned on the show before, but I think it applies to a lot of situations. And it is basically that no one cares what happens in Thailand. Nothing matters in Thailand. Anything goes in Thailand until it becomes embarrassing to Thailand internationally. Agreed. Until yeah, other th- countries yep. and people start judging Thailand. Yeah, this is great. I mean, it has to do with like face and shame, but it's just amazing how something will be around forever and then it'll hit the international news i mean you and i have many examples the 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 classic one is is the wires you know and the first time i saw it was like was like i think bill gates or someone was here like 10 years ago and yeah it's bill gates yeah and and he took pictures of the wires and like kind of mocked thailand for the crazy wires on the street and then the government like flipped out and they immediately started putting the wires beneath the road when when right yeah, when, when yeah. thai people and expats have been complaining about the wires forever yeah exactly and the 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 case i can remember years and years ago there was a on soy God, soy seven i can't remember um seven slash one there was a place called dr bj's no points for guessing what happened there um <laughs> but it was someone wrote about it on some local website and then that got picked up by like an international website uh. and it and it got like it, it went a little bit viral and like within days the place was closed down i'm not probably not permanently because i think it came back later but right it caused a stink all right yeah so in other words thai people tolerated it the thai government tolerated it but as soon as it hit the international wire then it's like oh shit we can't allow that yeah exactly and uh, you know it, it, it also has a dark side too i remember years ago there was something like someone did an investigation some international journalist where they bought some some like tied like child porn dvds on some oh, sidewalk wow. vendor somewhere and there's like a massive police crackdown as there should have been i'm just right like, you right know. but they probably so, knew about that before the international story someone probably knew about it yeah but um right uh, i that, like it. that 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 was the retribution for that was was swift and sharp, but right. it did take the international exposure to make it happen. I like it. I think it's a good theory. F- fits with yeah. uh, just some generalizations about Thai culture. Yeah, I always say like when you see like a, a dirty beach or or you know like uh, some hotel building in a forest reserve or something like that. I always joke, half jokingly actually, like you should get Kim Kardashian over here and take a few pictures. Look at this dirty Thai beach, man. <laughs> I mean, boom, it would be cleaned up. By the next morning, dude, that's a great strategy. Like, if you're if you're in a, a Thai is. NGO and you're trying to fix something here, you're right. That this is a great strategy. You you pay a celebrity, so. you pay a celebrity to come and then Instagram it and complain about it. That's genius. I, I, th- this is right. this is a great strategy for Thai NGOs. If you if you want to motivate the Thai government to fix something, <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine someone with a massive social media following going like, "Yeah, I went to to Thailand to go to the beaches, but they were all covered in trash." So I went to Malaysia, and their beaches are wonderful. Oh, dude. holy moly, dude! I'm gonna. I, I know. I know people in the NGO space, so to speak. Uh, this is a great idea. I love it. Genius. Yeah, yeah. Genius. All right. All right. What's your next one? All right. Next one. Um, my next one is this. Um. You can say anything you want to a Thai person as long as you're smiling. Ooh, that's a good one. All right, let's unpack that. The idea is that Thai people, I mean, everyone does, but again, we're talking about Thailand or Thai culture. I think Thai people in particular really care how you say something. Um, yes. And, and I've, had this, yeah. I've had this experience in Thai companies, in a professional setting. I've had it with girlfriends wives uh wife uh and it's like it's they really i mean everyone wants to be treated respectfully of course but i mean if you just say everything nicely and if you smile then the content of what you're saying will not offend them but if you if you act angry or 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 pissed or or act insulting, then it doesn't matter what you're saying. And so it's it's like it's it's to, to me. I think the needle, and again, it, these are all like dials and needles. So these things are true of right. all human beings. But I think cultures are a little bit different. Like the dial is turned one way, and I just think the the dial in the West is turned a little bit more towards the content of what's saying what someone's saying. So someone is criticizing me. 
in, in an insulting way, but what they're saying is totally true. <laughs> you know. So what you're saying so, is so that I, context matters more than content. Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't think context is the right word. I, I really mean how you say something and whether you act pissed or condescending. The, the bottom line is that no one likes when someone yells at them. But it, but if someone's right, they're right. You know. And but but but, <laughs> right. but I think that. But I think that is is a Western perspective, whereas. <laughs> I just feel like the dial is turned a little bit more towards how you say something where you, you I, th I think you could say something to a Thai person that's fair, like might be actually insulting. But I mean, if you're, if you're just not mean about it and you know, you maybe present it in like a joking way, it's more acceptable. It's just, I, this is like, my thing. <laughs> like, it's, like instead of saying, Hey, you stink. You, or you could say like, who, who brought in the durian? What's going on? Yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's like you could, you could, maybe you could tell a person they have body odor, uh, yeah. but as long as you're smiling, oh, no one has a durian here. Yeah, as long as you're like you, you just can't be like harsh or mean in your manner. Like the manner of how you say something matters. Yeah, I can see that. I can yeah. see that. So, and, and I, I yeah, think it, ma it matters that banks dealing with customer service people, we've talked about it many times, like anger almost just never works in Thailand. Like it just, no. when you blow your lid, like you, you're going to lose, like they're going to ignore you or not deal with you. You know, it's like, so it's, it, this is a corollary to this idea that like anger, anger just doesn't right. work. It doesn't work here. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. That's a, that's a good one. And I learned that uh, early, although maybe it doesn't stick with me as much as it should have. But um, like when you're negotiating price or bartering or haggling, you know, you shouldn't get you know mean about it. It's all a little game. It's a little fun back and forth. That that's right. To think about. That's right. That's right. Agreed. Yeah, that's a good one. All right. The next one is something that's uh, that I think about a lot, especially as a father. And I'm out, out out in a boot with my son. Um, this is just a general traffic safety law. It also applies to pedestrians as well. And the rule is never be the first one through a green light or the last one through a red light. Ah, uh, okay. Crosswalk or traffic. Ah, uh, okay. Now I think I I think That's I know what you're getting at. But so what's wrong with being the first one through a green light? Well, if you're the first one through a green light and you like take off as soon as it goes bing, there's usually like motorcycle guys. There's always some taxi or something like that who's speeding to be the last one through a red light. So you know there's a potential for the accident. And you don't want to be the last one through a red light like that taxi that's speeding because there's always motorcycle guys at the beginning of the queue at the corresponding green light who are waiting for the clock to count down. Right, traffic right, right, right. Three, two, one. And they always go like two seconds or one second early. Oh, got it. So they're, okay, they're right. pulling out a little okay. bit. It's just, it's just dangrous, man. And it's, it's no, you're not right. worth saving the, the, the 20 seconds you're going to make up. On okay. This is a uh, very practical advice, but I think it's totally valid. And basically what you're saying is a lot of Thai people, they do make this mistake, which makes it dangerous, you know, because Thai people are jumping the gun or they're racing through, like, just as the light turns red, they're still going to go through in the next five seconds. Right. Because they're right. not respecting the lights. We should. Like, if you care about safety, you really need to respect the lights and and, and, yeah. and give them some leeway. Like, don't try to push it. Like. You should right. actually re really respect the lights because other people aren't. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And this is something that I was very proud of my son. We were talking about traffic safety and I said, you know, and I said, you got to be careful when you're driving because even if I'm driving safely. And then he said, like, because you don't know if other people are driving safely. And Genius. Like, yes. That's it's that's good. Central rule of driving. That is good parenting. Operating a motor vehicle. That is good parenting right there. Oh, thank you. It's uh, it's especially valid on on like T intersections, you know, like not a four way intersection, but like a three way intersection, because there's always like if you're going, I don't know how to describe it, but you're like going along the top of the T even if the light is red, there's always like cars and motorcycles that keep going. Oh, uh, right, sure. Because they don't have to worry about traffic on the left, only on the right, right? So so like there's a, there's a crosswalk by my place and if you step out without checking first, there's a very high chance you're gonna get smoked by some motorcycle just flying right along the sidewalk. Oh yeah, nightmare, absolute yeah, nightmare, so keep yeah. keep that in mind. All right, cool, uh, I got my last one. What's yours? Um, All right. So this one, I think, uh, I did not come up with myself. A buddy of mine gave this one to me, but it was, as you said at the beginning of the show, it was like a light bulb went off. It like made total sense to Bing. me. And right. so my third theory is that in Thailand, there are no rules until there are rules. And I know that, <laughs> okay. I know that sounds like a contradiction, <laughs> but the idea is, <laughs> is this, that 
in Thailand, things seem to be so relaxed and liberal. Either either there's kind of no rules or a lot of rules are unenforced. So there's this general vibe of laxity and freedom, right? That's the that's kind of the default in Thailand. But then okay. when Thai people decide to enforce a rule, they're insane about it. It's like they draw the line. You know, it's like when they draw the line, the, 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 the rule has to absolutely be followed to a T. Uh, and it, the right. classic okay. one would, you know, this is, I think, one of the first stories I told on the podcast like three years ago or something like that was the story of my buddy who was up in Chiang Mai and he got robbed. Uh, the only thing he had that didn't get stolen was his passport, which is like the if there's one thing you, you need left, it's your passport. So he had right. a Thai bank account. So he went into his bank, which I will not name, in, in Chiang Mai <laughs> with his passport and said, hey, I, I got robbed. All, all my stuff is gone. I have no money. But luckily, I got my passport. I need to withdraw some money. And they they said, well, where's your passbook? Where's your savings book? Oh, the, the damn bank book. Right. Or book bank, as they yeah, call it. Yeah, the book bank. And he, he's like, no, I, I lost everything. My bag, like that, my, you know, he had his passport in his back pocket, but his bag got stolen. So he lost his phone. He lost everything. Money, absolutely everything. But he had his passport in his back pocket. And he was so happy to be like, I, thank God I got my passport. I'll just go to my bank. <sighs> and take wow. money out and so the, the woman at the counter like took his passport called up his account they're like yeah like you're so-and-so you live at so-and-so yeah and it's like yeah i need to take money out she's like well i can't let you do that without your without your book bank oh that must be so frustrating <laughs> <laughs> well what what he did was he and it's actually a very funny story uh, with a lot of details that i won't get into because i have told the story before but it was a couple of years ago but he just said he just told them i'm not leaving the the bank so if you want to need to call the police, do whatever you have to do. But I have no other options. I'm not going to the street and begging money like a, some scammer. So this is my bank. I have my passport. So I'm just, I'm not leaving. I Give me some. Really? Yeah. Wow. G- give me some of my money. You know, so he just sat down and he's like, I, I don't have any other options. So do. do I'm literally homeless right yeah, now. Yeah. Do with me what you will. Like if you have to call the police or arrest me or whatever. And um, the solution was. And this shows you how shitty the bank was. A teller who worked there said, all right, you can use my phone to call one of your buddies, because he lost his phone in Bangkok, have him deposit money in my account, the, the teller's account, and then I'll give you cash. Oh, my God. Yeah, so the bank- like Absolutely so unmo- the ba- unmovable. So the bank would not bend. Like they, that's what I'm, that's my whole point. There are no rules in Thailand and there are rules and they will not let you withdraw money. And if you don't have an ATM card, obviously if you have your ATM card, you can take money out. But if you don't have your ATM card or your book right. bank, it, even if they, there's no doubt you are who you are, that you have your passport, it doesn't matter. Like they just would not oh, bend. And it's, it seems so untie, but that's the lesson. That's the theory I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you is that there are no rules until there is a rule and then it's totally unbending it's completely unbending interesting for real that happened yeah that's a good one man yeah like anything goes until until, until it doesn't <laughs> and then Ooh, there's a rule against that sorry our hands are tied yeah sorry T- ties weird. can be quite strict that's a, that's the whole point is it's they're loose and then that's it they just draw a line and the rule has to be followed yeah yeah right and they're very they're very concerned about what their senior is going to say what the p is going to say you know like for sure Ooh, I can't do that because it's going to look bad for me. I'll lose face. There it is again, that face thing. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. All right, and the last one, actually, it's it's something that I wanted to bring up, but I actually heard it from our buddy John, who has been a guest on the show before. Um, but, you know, he tells this rule so well <laughs> that I thought maybe it would be better to have him on the show as a quick guest to explain this rule. And this is something, one of his theories about life in Thailand and understanding how how Thai culture works, his rule that he calls the range of the acceptably wrong. So let's hear what John has to say about this. All right, John, so we talked about your fantastic theory about the range of the acceptably wrong. I think it applies to a lot of uh, situations in Thailand. So uh, can you walk us through it and how you arrived at this wonderful bit of thinking? Yeah, sure. So this was many, many years ago. I I don't think I've been in Thailand that long myself. And uh, you know, I met this guy who had come here. He was making leather jackets, and he thought 
he could get a jump on his Italian and Spanish competitors if he could get, you know, quality leather goods made here. And right. that didn't work out at all. But to salvage something from his trip, he decided he would get labels made for his jackets. Um, so he found a, a label company online, um, but he called and they only spoke Thai. So he handed the phone to his reasonably bilingual, he said, um, uh, uh, landlady, who he explained, look, I want to get 10,000 of these labels made, you know, for my jacket. So she right. spent about 15 minutes on the phone placing the order and she hung up and said, okay, no problem. You know, it's all done. I said, great. So <laughs> later that evening, he gets a call, a very timid uh, person on the other end, you know, from an unrecognized number. But through his broken English, the other person's broken English and his broken tie, what emerged was that this was not a label printing company at all. It was an air conditioning repair shop. <laughs> um, and, but nonetheless, his landlady had spent 15 minutes placing and they had spent 15 minutes accepting an order for 10,000. <laughs> and he said, I don't know how to do business in this environment. I can't anticipate this kind of wrong. <laughs> and that got me thinking on the lines of the different kinds of ways things that can go wrong. Oh, okay. Uh, and so, you know, I think when you first come to Thailand and you're, you know, from, from a place like uh, the States where I'm from, you encounter uh, the, the Thai approach to, how do I put this, to, to doing things um, usually in the service sector, right? So, right. So you order food and what you ordered never comes or isn't what you ordered. And so when I first got here, you know, if I ordered, let's say, kapow, you know, mu, kapow, pork, and I got chicken, I was like, no, I, I really wanted the pork. I really, I really didn't want the chicken. And now, <laughs> yeah. it's, now it's exactly what I ordered. You know, <laughs> that, I mean, that's fine. I, it's it's within the kapow family. So um, <laughs> somewhere between ordering pork and getting chicken and having ten thousand labels. Uh, an order for 10,000 labels placed with a, an air conditioning repair shop lies the range, your personal range of the acceptably wrong. Right. I, I guess it would vary from person to person greatly, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think it varies over time. And so things like things that used to drive me nuts now, I just, I've anticipated them. So when they go wrong, it doesn't feel like they went wrong. They just went as anticipated. I wish that, <laughs> I wish that they had, would have gone another way but they went exactly as anticipated. And so I find that over time, uh, you know, it's not a smooth, you know, continuous upward curve, but over time um, there's a general uh, direct proportion between the amount of time you live here and, and the range uh, of your acceptably wrong. That's, a, that's really good. So like when you're first new to Thailand and you order like uh, a Denver omelet, and you get a uh, Spanish omelet. You're like, this is outrageous. I This is not right. what I ordered at all. I'm sending it back. But when you've been here 20 years and you order a Denver omelet and you get a club sandwich, you're like, yeah, it's food. I can eat that. I, I like club sandwiches. I spent the first uh, probably two or three years here fighting an incredibly uh, recurring um, and, and surprisingly difficult uphill battle to get coffee without any sugar in it. I remember ordering with you and you were like, my side, this, my right. side, that. No. And you were like. Right. My side, no, my side, no, con one. My <laughs> side, syrup. My side, nam tan. My side, the. You know, I would, I, I was joking that I, even, but even if I wore a chicken suit and sounded a tuba, you know, <laughs> as I pointed out each of these things as a concentration focusing strategy, it never worked. And it took me a long time to realize, I think, that uh, for the person serving me the coffee to serve it without any thing in it, it wasn't ready to be served. It was it was anathema to them uh, to give me coffee without milk or without sugar in it. Um, yeah. And, and and but but I can't drink unsweetened coffee and I have to have my coffee. I mean I can't drink sweetened coffee and I have to have my coffee. So my my range of the acceptably wrong stayed very narrow for a long time. And I finally resolved this issue not by saying screw it, I'll drink sweetened coffee, but by learning the Thai word, the Thai word for diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant brilliant not, not actually diabetic but that got their attention ah um, interesting if i would say oh go get my one get one my dine 
and I guess Bao Wan, like light sweet, is the Thai worm Thai term for for diabetes. And it wouldn't matter if I ordered this coffee at a Dunkin' Donuts at the same time as I ordered like eight latte spice monstrosities. Like that. <laughs> never, the leap was never made from the sugar in the coffee to the the box of. of actual diabetes cultivating snacks that I was buying. That's funny. But they would just go, oh, no, no. Like they would even see someone else going to put sugar in it. Oh, my die, my die. Huh? <laughs> I'll, I'll on. Terrible diabetes. I have unlocked the key to the kingdom. For getting more. That's really smart. Well, that's good, man. That's a good bit of advice. You need to have your own range of the acceptably yeah. wrong, which can also then vary depending on what situation you're in. On circumstance, I'm out of time. You've been here. And, and I think just being mindful of, a, of the the range of the accepted wrong. For me, just framing uh, situations that way has helped. That's awesome. Cool. So I back up and I say, okay, you know what? How unacceptable is this? How how bad is this really? And more often than not, it's like, eh, it's, you know, it's suboptimal, but, you know, I can live with it. Yeah, I'll eat a club sandwich. I wanted an omelet, but I still yeah. enjoy a club I mean, sandwich. One of my favorite stories of, of things going wrong, and, and this maybe is right on the fulcrum of between the accepted and unacceptably wrong was, um, I may have told you, it's going to the subway. I wanted a tuna sandwich. Sorry, all these revolve around food, but I, I wanted a tuna sandwich. Well, it is Thailand. I went I went to the subway that had recently opened up on Tang Law, and I ordered a foot-long tuna. Right. And I don't know if you've ever had a tuna sandwich at Subway, but there's, it's so pureed and there's so much mayonnaise in it that they use a an ice cream scoop Yeah. to take out. So a foot-long gets, you know, they cut open the bread and then they just put one, two, three, four, you know, horizontally. You would think that the principles of sandwich construction are sufficiently intuitive that I wouldn't need to walk the guy through it. But he put all four scoops on top of one another. Oh, jeez. As if he was constructing a, a, as if he had previously worked at, say, a Friendly's or Swenson's. So, <laughs> um, and then he took the, ice top, cream cone. the top piece of bread, exactly, and propped it on top of the the, the, the the four scoops of tuna in a manner most akin to uh, Elmer Fudd laying a trap for, you know, with the stick in the box. You know, like for, super carefully. <laughs> you know, but just propped up. And then it could he, explode he at any moment. And he kind of knew it was wrong, but his way to remedy it was just to lean on one side of the sandwich so that 80% of the tuna shot out the butt of the sandwich onto the counter and, like, sort of 20% dribbled back bread word <laughs> <laughs> and i was like ah so you know um and again i, I understand thailand's not a, a sandwich culture and and the guy was new to it and, and maybe he was nervous and, and all of this but i was presented with this choice like what do i do how do i navigate this and i <laughs> I, I i like to think that my having a sense of the the acceptably wrong tempered my response a little bit interesting um, yeah, right you know, I didn't take that because it wasn't possible to accept it as proffered. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when the when the when management got involved, we we smoothed it out. I think a little more. Uh, you got your tuna sandwich. I got my tuna sandwich with 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 a minimum amount of of cultural conflict. Right, and the minimum amount of tuna to fall into your range of the acceptably wrong. Yeah, yeah, and then you know, and then eventually. It, and, so, you know, if I look at the process, I would say, well, as part of the process, it's, you know, it's part of the acceptably wrong that the first pass at the sandwich might not be edible. <laughs> but the That's good. Part. That's good. So. Well, thanks, man. That's something to think about. And I hope uh, people take it to heart. It might help your time in the country go uh, a little, a little smooth, more smoothly yeah. than. Yeah. Was. Just, yeah. I think checking yourself a little bit. Right. Check um, yourself so before you wreck yourself. Exactly. Um, cool. Okay, man. Well, thanks for having me on again, and uh, anytime. Right. Thanks for your input. We'll talk to you soon. No worries. All right. Talk to you later, right. man. Yeah, that's genius. That's genius. I've heard him talk about this many times, uh, and it's <laughs> totally true. It, it's all about setting your expectations. That's exactly it. Yeah, the range of the acceptably wrong is such a a great way to put it, and. Whether it's food or, you know, you buy something or you order something and it's not quite what you want. And you're just like, well, you know, how vital is this to my, my existence? That's if right. It's not too invite, if, it, <laughs> if it falls within that range, you just got to say, well, TIT, this is Thailand, baby. Absolutely. <laughs> but it's, it's such a good way to put it. And I think, it, I think it'll help people once they uh, sort of uh, internalize that. 
and use it in a lot of situations, I think it'll help a lot of people sort of relax and not get too frustrated with how things work. Damn, I got to say, with these six theories, we're, we've really jam-packed a lot of wisdom uh, in, into this show. This, this could be one of our most useful shows ever for our listeners. Nothing but wisdom, top to bottom, left to right. Heck yeah. Hard-earned wisdom, I might add. <laughs> Hard-earned wisdom, yeah. I've got the scars. I've got the scars to prove it. Yeah, no doubt. Mentally and physically, I bet. <laughs> so those are our uh, theories about, you know, uh, understanding Bangkok and living in Thailand a little bit more. And I'm sure there are a lot out there that our listeners have. And if you have one, listener, send it on in. Let us know. Maybe sure. we'll do another show. But uh, Absolutely. There's there's always unique and interesting ways to uh, to look at Thailand and, and deal with it in your own way. So let us know what you think. All right, let's get into some Love, Loathe, or Live With, where one of us picks a particular aspect of living in Bangkok, which we then discuss and decide if it's something we love about living here, loathe about living here, or have come to accept as something that we just have to learn to live with, no matter how we feel about it. The last time Ed asked me what I thought of the street side orange juice vendors, so this week it's my turn. All right, hit me. This is a simple one, man. Uh, straightforward. How do you feel about the lack of seatbelts in taxis? How do you deal with that? Ah, interesting. Um, well, for one thing, there's not a total lack. I, I feel that over the years, uh, it, it's gotten a little bit better. I, I, back in the day, I never remember even having seatbelts as an option. But I feel like some taxis have seatbelts now. Um, I think the newer ones have the shoulder ones that you pull. Yeah, your- here's the truth. Um, I don't care that they're not there, but I should. That's the truth. <laughs> you know, the, yeah. bo- the bottom line I, is I just yeah. roll, I just roll with it, even though that's a bad idea. I I, I loathe it, but I but I live with it. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. I never ask the guy. I, I never dig in the seat. I never ask the guy. Hey, yeah, yeah. Any seat belts. I just I live with it. Yeah, uh, I shouldn't. Yeah, yeah. I I, so I, I'm gonna have to say live with. But e- even though intellectually I know this is something that I should hate, and I every time I get in a taxi I should insist on a seatbelt, but I just don't. I don't. Yeah. What can I either. say? Yeah. What can I say? <laughs> um, <laughs> although I, I do feel that there's more of an option. And sometimes I have put seatbelts on in a taxi, but it's typically, you know, normally I don't sit in the front seat, but if I'm with a group of people, I might sit in the front seat. And of course, you're much more likely to put on a seatbelt if you're actually in the front seat, right? Yeah, um, of course. Then then the seatbelt's almost always there, and then I almost always put it on. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, in the back seat. But it has conditioned me to be weird, though. Like when I'm in the back seat and I don't put on the seatbelt, and then the driver's driving, and he's driving, he's driving not very well, right. like dangerously. Right. Then I put it on halfway through, and I'm like, I wonder if I can put it on quietly so he doesn't hear me <laughs> click it in. And then like he'll think that like, oh, this guy's driving is so bad, I have to put my seatbelt on halfway through the trip. That's great. <laughs> so That's great. I feel like Greg Jai about it. Yeah. What I do, <laughs> what I do is kind of passive aggressive. If the guy's driving crazy, sometimes I exaggeratingly like put my hand on the seat in front of me. You know, it's like he's driving crazy. Oh, really? You know, he's driving crazy and I might be getting jostled, but I'll just, <laughs> That's funny. I'll just kind of slam my hand into the seat in front of me as if I've, you know, uh, but I'm, it's really just passive aggressive oh. messaging. <laughs> Smart. You know, I was, I had a friend one time who said that whenever the taxi driver was driving erratically or dangerously, he would just lean forward and very apologetically and politely say, I'm sorry, uh, can you slow down a little bit because I get car sick. Oh, good and idea. like that they'll slow down right away because no one wants to clean someone else's puke. Good idea. Car. Another, God, yeah. this show is filled with genius advice. Jam-packed. Jam-packed. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> no, I gotta, I gotta say live with, even though it should be a loathe. Yeah, same. <laughs> All right, so as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, we'd like to say thank you to Steve Shea for lending us his support at the show Shoutout Level. Greg, what did you find out about Steve? Well, I uh, corresponded with Steve a little bit here, and it turns out that he and I very nearly met during our early days in Bangkok. Like, we were almost Pat Pong drinking buddies if fate was a little bit Damn. different. So, yeah, here's the story. He says, he says, I arrived in Bangkok for the first time on June 27th, 2001, and my first few evenings there were spent partying in Pat Pong. And I remember meeting a couple of Canadian guys in a bar there and drinking and chatting with them. And I've wondered ever since you started the podcast if it was you I met. Does that seem plausible? Ah, interesting. So Interesting. I remember because I was like, oh, damn, because 
my first few nights in Bangkok were also spent partying at Pat Pong, down where Ty <laughs> Tom Jones used to be and dancing the night away and shopping and drinking. So I, I had to go back to find out what day I actually arrived in Thailand. But he got here on June 27th, 2001. I got here on July 24th. Ah, I see. So we missed each other by a month, but we were almost drinking buddies. I see, I see. see how Pat, well, Pat you know, uh, I think you could make up for that. I think you could become drinking buddies. That's right. That's right. The best time to be a drinking buddy is in 2001. The second best time is tonight. <laughs> so there we go. <laughs> For sure. As the old Chinese proverb says. <laughs> yeah. So Steve says, he says, I returned to Bangkok in 2003, made the fateful decision to start a relationship with a girl I met in Soy Cowboy. I know, I know. I was young and foolish. The relationship didn't last beyond 2006, but I was still visiting Bangkok every year up until 2009. But work life commitments have prevented me from returning since then. So I guess he's got a big trip coming up. Ah. Uh. Yeah, so what, what, he's coming back? Is that the idea? I don't know. He didn't say when, but since 2009, that's a long time ago. So I guess, I mean, if he still listens to the Bangkok podcast, maybe he's planning a trip. Cool. Oh, Steve, let us know if you're going to be in town, man. For sure. And check this out. The little last little bit of trivia. He said, in 2003, I also met Suvanant Kop Kong Ying, the Thai soap opera actress who had found worldwide fame and notoriety after being blamed for starting the Phnom Penh riots that year. Right. You remember that? Yeah. We actually did a show about that. That's season three, episode 66. We did a show about that. It's yep. called the Thai Soap Opera Riots. Yep. Yeah, that was a crazy time. So he says he met her at an ice skating rink, and uh, she seemed a very unlikely person to start a diplomatic incident. So that year, I had a good anecdote to share with Thai people. Oh, that's great. I like it. So Steve's, Steve's already, he's only been here a few times, but he's already hobnobbing with famous people. <laughs> get lessons from Well, hope he can make it back soon. Yeah, totally. Thanks for the support, Steve. Hope to see you back here soon. 2009 is a long time to not be in Bangkok. And uh, let us know when you're through. And, you know, by then, Pat Pong should be open. And you and I will head out and be the drinking buddies that we were fated to be. For sure. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> All right. A final thanks to our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a ton of cool perks and the warm, fuzzy feeling, knowing that they're helping support the show. Find out more by clicking support on our website. And connect with us online. We're Bangkok Podcast on social media, bangkokpodcast.com on the web, or simply bangkokpodcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from our listeners and always reply to our messages. That's right. You can also listen to each episode on YouTube. You can send us a voicemail through our website that we'll feature on the show, or even reach out to me directly on Twitter, where I am, BKK Greg. So thanks for listening, everyone. Take it easy out there, and we'll see you back here next week. For sure. Damn, I gotta say, with our with our six theories, with our six theories, I said six theories, <laughs> six theories. Um, 